Hello, South Strong Nation, Joe Simons, Lick Diamonds. We are back. We are live again. Let's go live to Facebook while I'm doing some intros here. And this is going to be another Tackle Tuesday. And we're going to talk about the different rods, reels, lure, et cetera, that we're personally testing out here. We're going to take a lot of questions from you and also share some cool things that are happening. Why I try to take this live on the old Facebook. Can you guys introduce yourself? The other talking heads on this amazing Tackle Tuesday podcast. Right, let's have the new guy start. Mark. New guy. New guy. New guy. <laughs> All right. My name is Mark. Um, uh, new to the team. Um, this is uh, going into my second week. Come from the retail segment of our industry. So extensive knowledge there on the retail setting. So I'm trying to help out the guys with a lot of the product um, informations, a lot of stuff on you know tutorials, a lot of the on the water footage. Um, as Salt Strong kind of grows into the industry and other segments like freshwater, I'm going to be a big part of that. Um, but looking really looking forward to being part of the team and and adding my my two cents into it. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're pumped right. to have you. Yeah, and for those uh, for those insiders, if you've been to the discount page recently, uh, particularly the the equipment section, you will notice a lot of new stuff, and uh, that is that is due to Mark. Mark has opened a lot of doors, and uh, so it's growing. It's grown a ton over the past couple months, and it should be growing a ton more in the very near future. Yeah, just as a quick reference, so all the insiders and everyone has an understanding, right now on the system, I have about 1,500 items uh, almost ready to go live, um, and then I'll have about another 10,000 by week's end. Um, so we're going to add a ton of product. Um, unfortunately, for the rest of the guys like Wyatt and Tony and all the guys, that means a lot more work. For them because there's a lot more to review a lot more to shout out um, but at the end of the day we want to build the biggest platform possible for all of our members to, to get the best discounts to get the best knowledge um, and to have the best deliverables from us um are you sure i i you, you said ten thousand or do you mean a thousand did you say ten thousand i did say ten thousand oh snap crackle pop that is a lot of tackle, dude. That's a lot of tackle, but we're going to kind of broaden our horizons a little bit. It's, it's of course, going to be primarily driven to the inshore market for now. Um, but you're going to see a lot, of, a lot of love on the freshwater side hitting the platform pretty soon. And actually, a lot of the nearshore, offshore kind of products hitting the market pretty soon. Um, you know, because our fishery is a dynamic fishery, not only here in Florida, but up, even up there close to Wyatt and his water, you know, some of that, you know, near shore, offshore stuff, a lot of guys kind of do both segments, the inshore and the offshore. So we're going to offer, you know, products to, you know, we'll make everyone happy now. It's awesome, man. We're so pumped to have you on and uh, Mark's an ex pro bass dude. He, uh, he knows his stuff, man, especially when it comes to, to reels and uh, and rods it's um it's pretty doggone impressive so we're we're so stoked to have you on board Appreciate and, uh, it. as as we talked about last week on tackle tuesday we have uh we got some new new things ourselves up our little sleeves here with uh one in particular the alabama leprechaun new uh, jerk shed we're coming up with so we're we're pumped on that i don't know what's going on with this uh live it still says preparing you guys seeing it on facebook at all i'm not seeing it not well, yet. Then we will keep proceeding as if we have no live audience. It's just the five of us dudes talking. Let's uh let's kick and I guess we haven't introduced everyone else. We Mark took so doggone long with his amazing bio. So we got Tony, Wyatt, Luke. Yes. Yeah, buddy. The crew? Team Salt Strong? Crew is here. All right. So who's gonna kick it off? Who's 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 reviewing stuff this week? Tony, I saw you put up quite a few videos here uh over the weekend man yeah we're reviewing all kinds of stuff pretty much just going through my tackle and seeing what i've got what i've been using uh there's been some stuff i've just been buying just to try out like uh, this lure lock tackle box here we just posted a 
full video on this, but it basically has these inserts in the trays and it keeps your stuff from falling out. So you can see there's, <laughs> there's tackle in there. So there's no super glue there. Upside down and it's, it's not falling out. So it holds pretty well. You'll see a pretty interesting test in the video that I did using a four ounce egg sinker, see if that came out. So definitely uh, check that video out. But yeah, it's pretty handy, especially if you've got like uh, swivels and hooks. Usually they slide underneath the dividers, like if your tackle box flips over or slides around and it just helps keep that stuff in place. So pretty, pretty handy, cool little product there. What about guys like Luke that have really weak wrist? Is, is it too strong of a magnetic force where you can't pull it up? Um, I think you'll be all right. <laughs> Luke. Yeah, they got to use the strong hand, right? Yeah, use the be... strong hand. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I did realize after I did the video, I didn't mention this in the video, but like if you have really small hooks and they're stuck to the bottom, it's really tough to get them out. Or if you have like one swivel you're trying to grab, it's really tough to get them out with just your fingers. So you may have to use like pliers or something like that to get them out. But overall, pretty cool little product there. You glad you bought it? Um, I don't think I'll be using it <laughs> <laughs> because I like to have waterproof um, stowaways, especially in the kayak. Uh, I don't want water magically getting in there and then I go to put it away and open it up the next time I go out and everything's rusted out. So yeah, water, waterproof is essential. I know that's all I use now is waterproof ones yep. because I've had, if it, all it takes is, is one little drop of salt water in there and the whole, whatever's in there is ruined. And it's happened to me once, actually a couple of times. I didn't learn the first time. <laughs> so now I have, I have to multiple times now and uh, waterproof everything. Yeah. Another thing I, Notice it's dishwasher safe. And one thing I was wondering about it, one question came in on the, uh, the post about this is if it gets a bunch of dirt inside, then what? So it's dishwasher safe. So I'm going to try that out. I'm just going to put a bunch of dirt in it and see how much it cleans out. Hopefully I don't uh, ruin my dishwasher with dirt, but <laughs> could be a cool test to do with that. But the problem, so here's the one I, I've been using just the Plano Plano waterproof. I mean, they're like at Walmart. They're pretty much everywhere for my hooks. They're really for all my stuff. But the one for the hooks is very frustrating because there's a lot of gap. Um, and and so I, Mark, I don't know. Is there? Is there? Does anybody make one that that has like ridges at the top to prevent the gap where hooks can slide over the top? Because my tackle box, Otis would always knock it over, and it ends up upside down. And now I've got hooks everywhere. Yeah, so what the problem was with a lot of the extrusion is to answer your question, what they're starting to make now is all the inserts and the row dividing tabs will have a flat surface. Um, that way when the lid closes down, it closes to the flat surface. But what the problem is, especially in, in, in our climate down here in the Southeast, when that heat really starts to warm these boxes up, those top lids still don't seal down very well and they're still going to kind of slide and get hung up there. But y'all, y'all need to incorporate what I do. It, my wife, of course, her being a nurse, I get the 13 dram pill bottles. So I have like the little medication bottles that pills come in and I have like 20 of them and I write down my numbers like a three aught hook and I put all of my three aught hooks in that pill bottle and then that way it's an easy reference for me to find what size hook I need and I don't ever have to worry about hooks flying all over the place. Good idea. Good point. You probably freak out some new people you take fishing and they open your thing and see a bunch of prescription pill bottles. You know, <laughs> you know, I want to be careful with that. Days, you know, the tournament stuff, you know, it's all about time, right? You know, we had to cut down the time that we were spending rigging up our product on the water because every time, all the time was, was, you know, we wanted to catch our fish with, you know, so that it was a quick reference. I can grab a three yacht pill bottle. I know it's a three yacht hook in there. I like I see it. A, another thing a lot of people do is they'll take a safety pin and just slide their hooks onto the safety pin and close it. And that'll right. keep them all in place too. Easy to, easy to access them, keep them organized. That's right. The worst ones are the little, uh, my little ones for catching pinfish. You know, if I do catch pinfish, just put, you know, get a little chunk of gulp. And that, so it's like the size 10 hooks, the little gold hooks. And 
they'll just get in every little nook and cranny that I think the pill bottle would be perfect for that. I know yeah, you, would, that. you would laugh with if you saw my, I have three or four boxes of nothing but terminal and <laughs> all of them have pill bottles in it. <laughs> Pills are good. Wyatt, dude, what are you, uh, what are you working on? What kind of reviews are you going to be uh, doing here in the next week or so? So I've got some pretty interesting stuff coming up. It's starting to turn to top water time here up in North Carolina and the same makers of everyone's favorite uh, live imitation shrimp from Chase Bait also make a really interesting top water. It's called the drunken mullet. And basically this functions a little bit differently. Like someone might've been drunk when they created it. Look at that. So. <laughs> yeah, it's insane. I mean, look at this guy. He is, he looks really lifelike. He's disjointed. What's really cool about this thing, uh, as opposed to your normal spook bait, uh, is it's got a little propeller on here too. Uh, really uh, interesting action for sure. But I would say probably the most interesting benefit, most spooks sit up like this and because uh, the redfish, you know, their mouths are on the bottom of their chin rather than trout and snook that can uh, attack from uh, below. This thing sits downward um, for those of you who may not be seeing the video listening to this on the podcast the tail sits further down in the water which makes it a little bit easier for those uh, those reds to come up and get it and it's obviously even easier for the snook and trout to uh, attack it so i'm testing out a bunch of different top waters what's, what's on the back of that thing is it a propeller yeah so yeah. this is uh it spins in the water and it's if you've ever seen any of those old prop baits that you would use for bass that had the little helicopter blades it functions the same way but this actually has i think a better action on it. It's a little bit more controlled, but it creates a, just enough of a disturbance in the water, like that, that Goldilocks zone where it's not too much, but it's also not too little. And there's obviously, you can hear it, a bunch of little ball bearings in there making all kinds of sounds that, I mean, this thing, I haven't gotten a chance to test it out yet. We've had some tornadoes here in North Carolina. So the winds have been rough to get out on the water, but I'm excited to put these to the test and uh, see what they can catch. Man, you stick some LED lights on that, and uh, you're going to scare everything in the ocean. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's pretty crazy. The price point is, is pretty crazy as well, but I think if it, uh, if it can catch as many fish as I think it will, it's, it's going to be well worth the price. So what's the price? What, yeah, what's the damage on that thing? It's like $14, $15 per loop. So do not go tossing it near mangroves. Don't go tossing it near any structure you're going to lose. I'd be fishing this thing over some like open flats, maybe – over an oyster bar and uh, make sure that you're seeing some mullet around and you'll probably have your, your best results there. All right. Might want to test that out in a swimming pool first so we can yeah. actually get a review. <laughs> yeah, I'm curious to see that. It almost looks like it's too loud for a lot of the waters I fish, but uh, I don't if know. You, if I you fish it really meat. slow, the wake is really not that insane. And you could fish it uh, like you would a spook. You can walk it and you can see the body it joints. So it does have a little bit of a walk the dog action, not as good as your average spook bait. But if you, the, the propeller on it, I mean, it is, I think it's the best prop bait I've ever used, no doubt. And I've used a lot. It was one of my favorite lures for bass and I caught a lot of bass with it. So I, even if you wanted to use it in freshwater, I'm sure that uh, maybe, maybe Mark can put that to the test. A whopper plopper 2.0, baby. That's, yeah, that's what it looks like. It looks like a whopper plopper on steroids. There you go. This is, uh, this is the whopper plopper here. I did a review that's on right. this a while ago and caught some some really nice trout on it. But and, uh, what I was going to say, the nice thing about these is you can fish them really, really slow in calm water, and it'll just create like a little bit of bubbling and they call it like a blooping sound <laughs> when you're reeling them in. Then if it's really choppy out, uh, really windy then you can really rip them and make a lot more noise draw attention to them but tony have you used that since your review or is it yeah i mean my, my go-to is the super spook junior either in the bone white or the bone silver color i mean i try to keep it simple you know i, I test out a lot of lures but i i always end up going back to my go-to's just to keep it limited Cool, trust me. Changing baits every two minutes, wasting time. And, and why have you caught fish on that on that plug yet? So this guy, no, I have not. Just because, like I said, I I picked it up not too long ago, and the winds have been really tough here. But I'm hoping to get out and put it to, put it to the test on the water soon. But I think to your point, Tony, that Spook Junior, it's it's a fantastic all around bait. But I think for some guys who might just be getting new into top water, um, it might be a little bit difficult to learn how to walk the dog if they want to see some of those top water blow ups, which is super fun. And an another option is I'll be testing some from Yozuri, uh, but just a straight open face popper where it, uh, it just chugs along. Um, I'll be testing one of those too. This is just your most basic one that you can get from Bass Pro. Um, 
But yeah, I'll be testing those. These are two really good options for getting into top water fishing. Uh, if you don't know how to walk the dog yet, I highly recommend you learn how to do that because it, it really can catch a fish in almost any scenario like Tony said. But prop baits and chuggers are super easy to use. A constant retrieve where you can just pop them um, with your rod tip and you can definitely get some strikes that way as well. Yeah, the good thing about, about this, right, about us is that we will use them all and we will report what happens, right, mm -hmm. in an unbiased way. The, the good and the bad and the ugly. Um, the fact that we're not tied to any specific uh, manufacturer is, is, I think, a unique thing that we have where we can literally put, you know, two brains together and give you a true unbiased guidance and then let you choose as you please. And so we can work with it, whatever companies we want. And, uh, and, and with Mark here, we're going to be testing out an absolute ton of lures. Yeah, I'm really excited to compare, you know, the the Rapala and the Yozuri, you know, some of the pencil baits that they have, you know, because on the bottom of their baits, they have such that aggressive V-shaped bottom to it that, you know, kind of creates that keel. And those that, you know, that fish similar to me as far as style go, you know, yes, the traditional walk the dog technique is always going to be a, a tried and true. But sometimes, you know, for those bigger trout, you know, bigger fish, you know, when you hammer that rod tip and make that, that, that bait just dart real heavy and violently to the, you know, to one side and just kill it for a little bit, you know, those V bottomed style twitch baits are, are going to be killer for that technique that I like to, you know, deploy whenever I'm out there trying for that hard, hard bite, you know, and I found that some of my biggest trout have come on that aggressive, you know, rod twitch to where that thing will dart three foot off to the side. What, yeah, and what baits uh, do you use, Mark? Top water. Um, so uh, traditionally speaking, I'm a, I, I, I like using Rapala. So when we were talking about, you know, some of our tried and true baits, you know, I, I like the little twitch of mullets. I like the little small profile style baits. Um, but I'll tell you, you know, in the last five or six years, um, Yozuri and Rapala really have come, I mean, to the pinnacle of our, of our industry. You know, their paint schemes, their – they're, you know, crackled looking finishes, glass finishes. I mean, it, it really is a unique color scheme pattern. Um, and the baits are fantastically made. So I'm, I'm curious to, to really put the two of them side by side to see which one really can handle the style of fishing that I do with that high, you know, highly violent, you know, twitch pattern. And what about what reels? Oh, I'm, I was, was going to ask him about reels. Mark, what, uh, what are you excited to, to put to the test? I actually, let me ask you a different question. You, you've been working in a, in a tackle store that's, that's doing, you know, millions of dollars of a, a year in sales. So you see a lot of people, a lot of questions. What, what are some of the, the biggest questions? And, and I have to assume it's the top three are, are still in terms of uh, inshore kind of spinning. What we usually talk about is Penn and Daiwa and Shimano, or is there something else out there that's, um, well, I, I would no longer put Penn in the conversation anymore. You know, they have kind of lost a, a lot of their majority, not so much because of, you know, I, I, I don't want to say that the quality has dropped off. It's just, I think the younger anglers coming up, um, they're a different angler than what we were. You know, they, they want to have two really, really good combos instead of us older anglers that need to have 40 combos in our boat, you know, we, we probably wouldn't have, you know, the CI fours or the Stratic FLs on a combo, like a St. Croix rod kind of deal. We would have a more marginal based product and have more of them. Um, so I would say the newest, you know, kind of deal is of course, Shimano Daiwa, our two Japanese products are, are probably still one and two, in my opinion, as far as brand recognition goes with younger generation anglers. Um, and then everyone really kind of shares that last spot. Um, so yeah, most of the stuff that, that I feel this, as far as, you know, questions go is, you know, it seems like the dynamic of our industry is, how small can I go in a reel? How small can, how light can I go on a rod to still do what I want to do? And, and I think that you'll start seeing a lot of 1,000 class reels, 2,000 class reels, 2,500 class reels, really starting to be a major focus of our inshore industry. 1,000 too, huh? 
Yeah, yeah. So Stratic 1000, Fierce 1000s, you know, a lot of these reels we are selling a pile on, you know, and that's the beauty of, you know, going back to Penn, you know, is now you have an entry level of, of $59 for a Fierce 3 1000. So, you know, you can get into that lightweight segment for hardly any money. So, and that if you want, of course, better quality, better componentry, a smoother product, then you can go up to a 1000 Stratic. But um, you would be shocked in how the smaller items are really starting to put a, a big stronghold in our industry. That's fascinating. What about rods? What are you pairing it up with? Uh, mo most of the guys that are going that lightweight, you know, they're, they're still kind of keeping it lightweight on the rods as well. So they're, they're more so going to make it a trout outfit. So that, that medium light would be kind of their heaviest, you know, rod, you know, set up for the 1000. So medium light, sometimes even a light action, you know, pairs well, and they're going to just make it a, a nice, you know, speckled trout, you know, kind of a combo and then kind of finesse the other fish if they hit. Luke, Tony, Wyatt, do you guys have any any really super light 1,000 uh, setups yet? No, the oh. smallest I have is 3,000. That's about the smallest I've gone. And I pair have one. my rods and reels on medium to medium heavy. Yeah, I don't have any 1,000s. I, I did get a 2,000. That's that Piscophone reel that I've been testing out. And, uh, and it's, I mean, it has plenty of line. If just using 10-pound line, it holds plenty. I mean, I caught a 42-inch smook with it without, like, having – it made some good runs. But I looked at the line, at the spool, and there was still plenty. Like, I wasn't at risk of getting spooled. Um, and, and those things, I mean, with 10-pound line, you only need, like, three pounds of drag. And so you don't need – like, I used to go look at all the – the metrics on reels and if it didn't have 20 pounds of drag i was oh that's junk you know I, I i'm not getting that but i was only using 10 pound line like anything more than three pounds isn't needed and so now um i i just go like mark was saying you can go more inexpensive on the reel and then apply the savings to a nice rod and what i found is that the rod will help you catch more fish the reel will just help you catch the same amount of fish a little bit smoother so I, I, I put all my, not all my focus, most of my focus on rods, not so much on reels anymore. What's up with that bull bay rod? You, Luke, you and I went fishing last Friday and we started tearing it up. We were catching tons of grouper, reds, trout, snook, and we got a, a nice slam real quick. And all of a sudden the lightning storm came, we bolted, but you were about to tell me uh, how much you were liking this bull bay rod. I personally don't own one. Uh, what is it you like about it? Yeah. I mean, I like the action. It casts well. It's a, and, and the, I like the fact that the, the butt is a little bit shorter than a lot of other rods that are seven six. Oh, you like but short butts, huh? <laughs> I like short butts. Well, the longer <laughs> butts just aren't needed. It's still, it's still, uh, it's still plenty long enough to, to where I'm not even like on the on the double haul, like you know, on the the dark cast. You know, I, I don't even have the bottom hand at the very end. I have it up a little bit, so it's plenty. It's plenty big enough, but it casts more like an eight foot rod. Um, so I get really good casting. What I don't like about it, and it feels good and everything. And it's like, it's light enough to where I'm casting these little crab lures, these little crab, these light crab lures for sheep's head that we just did some, uh, some reviews on. I did, I, I've used it with both these lures, super light, cast them accurate, but it's heavy enough to, to chunk out some top waters and, and heavier plugs too. Uh, what I don't like about it though is, is the actual grip on the one I got. I just don't like split grips. And, uh, and so this one, I think right now they only come in split grips, I believe. Uh, but I think they do some custom ones, so. Uh, so anyhow, I, I love the blank. I don't like the butt so much, but, uh, but I, they do have some custom ones. So I'll try out one that, that has like the type of grip that I like with that same blank that could be the ultimate rod. Cool. And so what are you reviewing this uh, coming week or so? Uh, well, yeah, back to top water. So I, I, I did the test last fall and I just never did have time to, to go through the footage and post it, but I, I did a detailed test on my two favorite topwaters to see how they perform. And so I did the, the Rapala Skidderwalk versus the uh, Super Spook Junior. And I got, so they're both the same size. Um, and I, I had them on two rods, the exact same rods. And I took them out like four times. And I caught slams on most of the trips. And every time I would make three casts and then switch three casts after three casts, three casts. So, I would fish for hours doing three casts, three casts, and I was logging what I caught. And, uh, and so I won't save the final conclusion, but there was, 
what I learned is that both of them caught fish. Like none of the times did I, did I not catch a fish with each plug. Um, but I did see that one would outperform the other and vice versa based on the amount of wave activity in the water. So one was better in the calm, one was better in the rough stuff. And you'll have to see that review to, to see the conclusion. Hmm. All right. So in a yeah, fight, What's in that? a fight between those two teamed up against Slam Shady, who wins? Oh, no doubt. So, I mean, uh, so Slam Shady <laughs> is going to win, obviously. I mean, subsurface will almost always beat topwater. Like topwater for thrill, it's almost like driving. Like, do you get a driver or a putter? A putter is going to help you your score better, but a driver will make you look a little bit cooler off the tee box. Um, like the Slam Shady will help you catch more fish, but a topwater bite is just so much fun. So I, I think everybody needs to have both. But if you want to make sure you don't get skunked and that you catch fish every trip, you have to have sub subsurface. And right now, Slam Shady is the best for overall consistency that I've tested so far. All right. But I, always, I will always have a top water in my, in my tackle box because nothing beats a top water bite. One more. Slam Shady against a hurricane. <laughs> what, what if the hurricane is Hurricane Slam Shady? <laughs> Uh, if you guys haven't seen that, a little uh, little Ditka from uh, yeah, SNL. Yeah. Saturday Night Live back yeah. in the, back What if in the, the hurricane is Hurricane Ditka? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no contest. Yeah, no contest. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, and then as far as reviews, too, I mean, the, the crab ones, too, for those, um, it, there's still a lot of sheep's head inshore. And so if you're looking to catch – sheep's head with lures we did two reviews recently if you haven't if you haven't seen them check them out um and this is a savage gear crab versus a, a chase baits they both work just like before but one like the chase baits does better on the drop like dropping down a piling this is amazing but it's not so good on it doesn't cast very far and, and like it's just sl really slow to retrieve this one is better once if you're if you're like covering ground like covering bottom this savage gear one which is a fraction of the cost uh, will actually do better so details in that review but yeah it's um it's really cool doing these experiments to actually see the specific situations that that you know that one lure will outperform the other and then vice versa mark what's the what's the story on chase baits i mean to us it seems like they kind of came out of nowhere but is, is it an australian company that had great yeah, lures there and moved to here why you know i'll say in about the last three years australia came on the scene, I mean, in a huge, huge way. Uh, Chase Bates came along, Nomad came along, a lot of these Australian brands came along. And, um, you know, they, they, the, what really made both companies so good so fast is they put a lot of marketing effort behind them. Um, Chase Bates, they, they made the most realistic looking crabs on the, you know, on the market. Um, you know, and they put a lot of emphasis behind it, uh, kind of grew it out of a grassroots level of area here in Florida, um, and then just try to get it out as, as quick as they can. Uh, same with Nomad, you know, Nomad being on the, on the offshore premise, um, you know, probably one of the hottest, um, you know, diving plugs on the market, um, and probably one of the hottest flatfall jigs on the market. Um, so just two huge companies that Australian made, Australian done, and both of them are, you know, got, you know, some good Florida ties. So just lots of marketing behind them right now. Cool. It's interesting. All right. Let's, uh, let's go back to this top water, which we've put a big focus on. Um, best, best type of rod, rod action for, uh, for top water. What, what do you guys like? I, I keep it simple. I use, I just use the same one or two rods for everything. I like, I like to get rods that'll, that'll cover everything that way. I'm not having to lug 15 rods out in the, out in the skiff or on the paddleboard. Oh, you like the I, opposite of a bass guy, you mean? Exactly. Oh! <laughs> Sorry, Mark, couldn't resist. I'll have 20 rods on the deck next time. <laughs> yeah, that, I, I just can't, I, I can't handle that. And uh, so I, I just get like a, a good medium, medium heavy rod, medium heavy most brands, medium with the TFO, medium heavy like everything else. And, and I just look, I just get, again, I get really nice rods that are fast action, have really good feel, but they, you know, the tip is soft enough to cast a little, a little tiny crab, like a little, a light bait, but, the, but it has enough power to launch the camera when I'm 
when I'm using, when I'm getting this underwater footage, I'm casting, literally casting a big camera out and it slings it. I mean, it works for top water, like a fast action spinning rod, in my opinion, it is the most versatile thing you can have where you can have just like one or two setups to cover, like to cover the bases pretty well. Wyatt, yeah. what about you? I would say that uh, I'm, I'm with Luke. I like to kind of use the same rods for all my applications, but I do have a couple that I won't throw top waters with. Uh, if they're of lighter powers, I know each manufacturer has different specifications for what qualifies as, as light or medium or and he medium heavy. But if I had to just pick one, I would probably go with a medium uh, and a fast, um, fast action. I like having a little bit of flex on that tip so I can give that nice little pop uh, especially if I'm working like a spook bait uh, that, that definitely needs to make those cuts really quickly. I, I like having that little flex in the tip. But if I'm using like the, the, the prop baits or, or chuggers or things like that, I would say the, the, the action on the tip doesn't matter as much, but you would definitely want to have a, a stiff rod because they're just going to grab that thing and go. Cool. Tony, what do you think, doll? Yeah, I'm in the same boat as far as using the same rods for pretty much everything. I mean, you get used to one rod and you get used to how you work a certain lure with that rod. And if you can, like, um, I'll throw jerk shads with the same rod that I'll throw a spook with or a topwater super spook. But if I had a preference, like when I used to bass fish, I, I, I was a guy that had six to ten rods tony you're on camera dude i can count come on tony rods behind you <laughs> tony's on the dark side <laughs> those are all just for show those are <laughs> half of them are actually offshore rods that i never <laughs> use but um uh, yeah if if i had to choose a specific topwater rod it would definitely have a softer tip uh, one, just for the action. If you use a rod with a very stiff tip, you're basically just going to drag that top water through the water. You're not going to get a lot of action out of it. So softer tip and also the softer tip will help when you're fighting the fish. Usually you have treble hooks or just single inline hooks and you can easily pull hooks with a top water because they're smaller and with the treble hooks, they can bend easily. So a softer rod tip definitely helps the top, uh, top water. Cool. Mark, what's, what's your experience? Yeah, I'm going to go completely far left on everyone right now. <laughs> so to me, um, you know, this goes back to one of the, you know, the unique things that I learned from the live bait mastery side is that's you, you match the rod with the bait that you're using. Right. So, you know, Luke has always talked about Mark, I've used a freshwater zoom horny toad bait on top for redfish well to me that bait needs a specific type of rod you know that's where i would use something on a heavier power but a really really extra fast tip you know just because you want that hook penetration because you're ripping a hook through a lot of plastic whenever you're fishing up top for a redfish so to me it's matching the rod to the bait traditionally on a very lightweight top water bait something that's very very lightweight in the wind kind of a thrown bait i'll use something that has a lot of tip to it where a fast might not be enough tip um also what plays into perspective is you know your wave height you know there's times where i throw top water in some pretty turbulent water just because it's still a good bait to use in in a, in a heavier chop well the, the faster that tip is might hinder the performance of that bait and vice versa so it, to me it's it's really the whole picture scenario i would say that this is one thing that i think all rod manufacturers do a poor job at is every rod manufacturer might say it's a fast tip but all fast tips are not the same fast tip okay it really is based on the manufacturer that you're using um, and, and to Luke's point, you know, where TFO might rate a rod a little differently than how other manufacturers rate their rod, you know, I would say that the true sense of the industry standard would be a medium action rod with a fast tip. But that means so many different things, especially with the rod manufacturer that I use a lot of. 
Which yeah, is, I, see, I test it out. I have a, a, a heavy power. So I, I just go to the, the stores and just like do, and, and put the rod like on the ground and, and just flex it. And, and, break it over, and try to break it over your leg, of course. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if I don't like it, I just break it right there. Like, <laughs> like, uh, like, was it Bo Jackson that did that? That's right. <laughs> But um, so, so anyhow, so I go to the stores and I, I wanted to test out a, uh, a St. Croix, the E6X series, which is like a high-end series. They're very nice rods. But I wanted to go test them out. And I, I start with medium heavy and then I'll go, I usually go down, like a, I'll go down like for TFO, I'll get one down to medium. But the E6X, like the medium, their medium heavy just still felt um, kind of like more like a wet noodle. It was just, it was just a softer tip than a normal medium heavy. And it's, that's the most frustrating thing is that there's no um, like set criteria across the industry, across brands that like, like literally, so I, I have a, a heavy power um, action E6X and it feels like my medium power TFO. So it's, it's uh, sometimes it even skips two levels. And I don't know, that's, that's always been a frustrating thing. And uh, and I guess there's no way to solve it, right? Because manufacturers can do their own thing. But that's just one thing to be mindful of. Or if you always use a medium heavy and you're switching brands, it doesn't always mean that you need a medium heavy for the next brand or a medium or a medium light or whatever, whatever the case is. Luke, you but, said the, you were using the St. Croix E6X or was that the G Loomis? I've oh, got sorry. The- yeah, G, G Loomis. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. That's my favorite rod. I, I love those E6Xs. They're great, especially for light trout setups like we were talking about earlier. I've got a 2000 series reel on one of their medium light rods. It's fantastic. Yeah, they're high quality, like super, a lot of feel. I, I've used those with the crab as well. And uh, yeah, a lot of good, like just good feel. It's, it's a solid rod. It's expensive. It's like, you know, 200, $230 plus or minus. But I mean, it's a, it is not, it is really nice. I was going to say too, when it comes to like standards, as far as like tackle and rods and reels, it's the same with reels, like a 3000 size reel of one brand, maybe a little bigger or smaller than another brand and like hooks, a three aught circle hook of one brand might be a little bit smaller or bigger than a three aught of a different brand. So it really applies to all tackle, all, all gear really. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you look at the nomenclature of a of a Daiwa product. I think Daiwa is still the last company to kind of standardize themselves with the rest of the industry. You look at a Daiwa BG, you know, three thousand. You know, that reel looks so big compared to other three thousands. You know, that's that's one of the unique things that Daiwa started to do with a lot of their products is now they're starting to have industry sizes. So if you look at their lifetime warranty reel, the exist, um, you know, now that new product is like the other 2000s of the industry, the 3000s of the industry. So they're now starting to produce that normal size. And I do think that reels are much further ahead of where rods are. Rods are all over the map right now. Yeah, and that's uh, yeah, the Daiwa too. Uh, when Joe and I w- went down to Amrata to fish with uh, with Captain Hollywood Johnson, uh, Hollywood. we were shark fishing, and uh, and he's like, yeah, you know, we might come, we might have some. We're gonna, he's, yeah, we should definitely catch some like black tips and stuff. And he's like, we might have like some big hammerheads or, or bull sharks coming. So I'll bring the big, I'll bring the big rig, and I was like, so, uh, and he pulls out a spin rod. It was a forty five hundred. and I was like, it was, it was a Daiwa and with a with a you know, you know a, a forty five hundred Daiwa BG on it. That's right. And and uh, I was like, yeah, here it is. It's like that's the big that's the big rig. And it's like forty five hundred. Like I used to use four thousands for like for trout, you know, and I was just like totally overpowering. And uh and sure enough, a big hammerhead came in. It was like a seven footer, and that forty five hundred BG totally worked it. I mean, it it was it was surprisingly good. So now like I used to always get six thousand size reels for tarpon, and my next tarpon reel is gonna be probably forty five hundred. BG after after seeing how well it did with that hammerhead. Yeah, yeah, but the thing to to as a you know a preface to that statement though is Daiwa's forty five hundred is the size of what some other manufacturers fives and six thousands truly are in in class size of the body. So what's the way to to tell what it, are, are the line capacities are those yeah. accurate where you can see okay how many yards of thirty pound test can it hold or twenty pound or what or ten pound. 
that's exactly how we used to tell i used to tell the staff you know go by in line capacity most manufacturers now tell you what the braid capacity is you know there's not many people that fish with mono anymore but you know kind of go apples to apples the best way that you can and line capacity is that criteria that that can happen so i'm actually shopping for a tarpon rig and is there and I'm curious too, from the manufacturer side, uh, and is is there a recommendation on how much line you should have, like for tarpon fishing or for, like say redfish and snook, like, is, or is it just kind of whatever you think you need? No, four hundred uh, yards for tarpon. What was that, Danny? Say four hundred yards for tarpon. Yeah, yeah. Fifty pound class. You're fishing from a beach or somewhere, you can't go chase it down. I would. Yeah, because yeah, I know it varies, right? Because like, if you're in a boat, you can always chase it down. But That's like, right. what about fishing from shore? You know, to to me, you know, with any of your inshore stuff, I think still the industry standard is you know packing a reel with, you know, with 150 yards, you know, and then you have your backing on it, um, and then you know more of your near shore, offshore stuff that golden numbers double. So that 300 yard base is traditionally where you are with product. Um, and with the advent of braid and, and guys, you know, you think about this too, look at how braid has changed in the last five years. You know, you got some new braid on the market, like, you know, the Seaguar products that are even thinner in application than any other braid ever. You know, so now, you know, we're uh, a 10 pound test is traditionally two pound, you know, size wise of, of what monofilament is. Now that's changing again. So now the, the, the Seaguar product is half that size. So, I mean, it, it really is changing constantly with more and more, you know, releases into the market on the braid side. But these, these reels will hold a, a mile of line. Yeah, so I wonder the casting distance, like for casting braid, I'm going to be doing some more casting contests. And one thing I've never tested is the is the actual, I've been testing out different lines, like one line versus the other on the same reel. I'm wondering the diameter of the reel, um, like going from a 1,000 to a 3,000, all else kept equal, right? Same line, same rod, same lure. Can I cast the 1,000 smaller, further because the rule size, the reel size, is smaller or does the bigger the wider reel have the advantage because there's gonna be less revolutions right is that you're gonna use the same rod too yes yeah, the same rod same everything and um i'm wondering or does it not even matter but um to me you know I, it seems like i don't know i do know the the height of the spool will play a difference like the mm -hmm. like the stratix for example the ci4 plus has a very kind of short spool and the FL is a little taller and I noticed a pretty good difference in the casting distance. That longer spool seems to cast better than the shorter spool on the CI4. Yeah, so to That's me, thing. I don't know about the actual diameter though. You know, if you, if you ever watch braid or any line come off of a reel, that heavy coiling action that the, you know, comes off the reel. It's like watching you know, a fire. You could do it for days. <laughs> the, you know, the, the biggest thing is to make it as lineal as fast as you can. And that was the whole, the whole big thing about, you know, I'm going to choke the guides down, you know, even using those little micro guides. The, the, the premise to that is to get that line as flat as you can, as fast as you can for the maximum distance on the cast. So me personally, I would think that the smaller reel would choke that line down even faster to hit that first major stripper guide flatter. Um, but I, I agree with Tony because I have physically seen an FL on the same rod cast further than a CI4 plus in the same category. I, I, I think he is a hundred percent right. That long cast style spool, it, it just, it, there's just something about how that line comes off. That's but, just but is it, is it a, an actual thinner spool? Like, like is the spool diameter different? Like I can't. They hold the same amount of line, but the like the three thousand FL and the three I or the three thousand CI four hold the same amount of line, but the spool on the FL is higher. 
You're right, but, then, but the, the arbor, it, the arbor in the middle of the spool is a wider arbor in the FL. Yeah. So that's why it's a longer spool because the center arbor is is thicker. But how would that how would that physically help? Because the line, like the line, still has to uncoil, like it. But is the is the diameter the exact same, or is I assume the the taller spool has a little bit thinner diameter? Like is that the fact? Because all the line is doing is just coming off the spool. You know, it's just coming straight up. I well, it has more to like. If you think about like a shorter spool, like the CI four, the line is changing d directions coming off the spool quicker. If that makes sense, like the FL, it's coming off the spool, like in. I uh, guess got, got a visual here. Like when you cast this line out, it's going to be coming off, and it's going to be you know going up. Then it's going to be going down. It's going to be going up, going down. And the longer the, or the higher the spool, you know, it's going to be coming off for a longer ex a period of time in one direction as opposed to changing direction. So That's I think right. that has a lot to do with, you know, the height of the spool. If you see some of these surf casting reels, I mean, the spools are like three yeah. inches tall. <laughs> Matter of fact, one of the reels that we're going to be doing a product review on is going to be the new Spin Fisher sixth generation, uh, the long cast for surf fishing. So they you know that a lot of our members, you know, want us to do some, some neat ideas with surf casting and stuff like that. And this is one of the, you know, the big reels that are on the market right now. And that's that ultra long cast spin fisher um, that has that really, really large Arbor, but a lot of capacity on the, on the, on the height of that spool. And I'll tell you, these things will zing at a mile. Interesting. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll pick some up. So is there, if the taller spool has better casting performance, then what's the benefit of the smaller spool? Is there one? Does it look cooler? Probably for weight, I would think. Like the industry has gone to, I want something compact, light. I want it to balance near my hand level. And I think that that's the reason why all these compact style reels really started to get a lot of momentum. Hmm. Um, because back in the day, Luke, you remember, you know, 10, 20 years ago, they had long cast spools back in the old Daiwa whiskers, you know, the, the older style reels, they had them back then. It's just the, the industry's kind of evolved to lighter, stronger, faster, smaller. And that's kind of how it's gone the last five years. Interesting. Sounds like a test. And got uh, a lot of a lot of good test ideas from this. And I know, Mark, this is your first podcast. I will apologize on your behalf. We have a rule that we don't use any big words. And um, about four and a half minutes ago, I wrote down the word lineal. I don't know what that means. So we'll have to look it up for our audience. Uh, we apologize in advance. We always say there's no math and no big words. So <laughs> lineal will be defined in the show notes. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, I will um, very frequently make up my own words, it, just in case <laughs> that's not a legitimate word. <laughs> it's a Southern thing. Uh, when, when right. it up. Uh, so let, let's end this, uh, since we, I, I want this whole episode to be more just about top water, because that was the majority of the conversation until we had uh, a really interesting conversation about spools. Uh, best favorite lure if you only have one and i saw that question came up in the insider community as uh, as well um i answered it with you know uh, azera spook or spook jr uh just so, because other than slam shady you mean I, i'm this but, is a top water okay. i guess you could turn slam shady into top water so what about if they named a top water slam shady oh <laughs> dirty pop slam shady top water <laughs> what do you guys think if you only only use one for top water yep it would probably have to be the Super Spook Junior in the bone color. I've caught trout, redfish, snook, even tarpon on that one lure. And uh, what about freshwater? Same. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yep, that's the main reason. I, when I fish freshwater, this was my number one top water. And I started throwing it in salt water, and they were hitting that too. But if I had to pick a second for freshwater, it would be the rebel popper, the tiny one, the really popper. small one. Uh -huh. That thing, <laughs> caught some big fish on that little popper. You have to good. beat up the hooks though. Very good. Luke, yeah, quiet. 
I would say, honestly, I, I know everybody here loves the spook, but I fell in love with these poppers when I started bass fishing. And I think in terms of conditions, I know that you can fish uh, the spooks and a lot of stuff, but I, I've had issues with them. Sometimes if it gets too windy with them not making the right kind of cuts, I just think the action created by these poppers is very unique and uh, you can adjust it a little bit more to whether it's calmer, or it's windier, it's just a personal preference thing, but I really love my poppers. And I'm looking forward to testing some more for the club here soon. Yeah, and I've, uh, so I'll, I'll go. I've, I've, uh, I've recently switched to the skitter walk. So I was a super spook junior fan. I still love it. I still always have one on me, but um, I feel like for catching slams, I was doing a little bit better, again, slightly better with the skitter walk. Yep, Tony's got one there. And I put single hooks on it, but but I like the skitter walk better. It has a lower, it sinks a little bit further in the water. So it, it just enables redfish to eat a little bit easier. And so, yes, I was catching slams with the super spook, but I feel like I was catching more redfish. I was missing a little bit less fish with the skitter walk. And I believe it was because it sits down a little bit, a little bit deeper in the water. But both of them are excellent. Very good. Marky and Mark. I'm going to go two different routes. My old school is going to be kind of a heading um mullet the, the old twitch and mullet uh, the heading days back many many moons ago um again for the for the fact that the rear end of the bait sits so low into the water level um it allows you to get pretty violent with it on a retrieve on the freshwater side i'm gonna have to go with the trixie shark um, a reaction innovation um a heavy kind of a uh, cut you tail kind of tails on both of the legs just gurgles the water just fantastic Makes i use their, wanna, their paddle tails for, for top water too what's that one tony i use their their paddle tails for top water too the skinny dipper oh yeah Houdini color that's been killing it recently i just went out friday afternoon and that's all they were hitting on lake Boy, Tahoe. you're going back ba oh bass fishing with it yeah Good stuff. Pretty cool. Guys, this was a fun one, a fun tackle Tuesday. Um, apparently, we never even went live on Facebook. I kept checking, and I don't know if it's a Zoom issue with all the things that they've had going wrong, but uh, I try to connect three different times. So, uh, great job. We went like 53 minutes just of us all chatting amongst each other. So, uh, next time, we promise we are going to do everything we possibly can to get on Facebook. I have no idea. It tried to connect three times and just kept clicking off so you know i think i think the fact that we went so long with just a couple topics like the next once we get questions coming in from facebook we almost need to do like a specific like top bar in this case maybe yeah. next time we do a, a specific niche there's just so much tackle out there amen and we'll we be testing it all a new tackle guru and one big thing that that we're doing and you guys might already notice this is a whole lot more reviews as luke mentioned we have no sponsors, so we can go get any brand we want. In most cases, we pay for it ourselves for our own money. Occasionally, we get some free stuff, but we tell them right off the bat, hey, if you want to send us something, that's cool, but just know we're going to talk about the cons as well and might even say the product stinks, yeah. and, which has only happened like one or two times where actually the one time, I guess we can talk about it now. It's called the Fish Call. That was the only time we didn't even publish it. It was so bad, and now I think the company might be under, so we, I don't feel too bad, but... That was when they sent us and we told them, I was like, man, like we can't publish this. And, and, a, and a guy asked that question, if you guys remember, and they made it on Shark Tank too. And I think Cuban, probably one of his bad investments, uh, invested in it. And it was a, basically this underwater transmitter of different sounds, shrimp sounds and scared mullet. And it was said to bring fish in. And Luke, remember what we did? We dropped it there in the, yeah. at so, the marina and, and actually yeah. filmed what was happening. And like the snook were scared to death of it. Yeah, uh, Gasparilla, a Gasparilla Marina where they, you know, they, they throw out all the shrimp. And so I was like, okay, well, there's a shrimp call. I was like, the, there's snook here. They're trained to eat shrimp. And so we dropped it in and like, phew, snook go away. <laughs> and obviously we're throwing in baits and everything. <laughs> and then we pulled out and then the snook came back and started getting more aggressive. And then we put it back in and it went away. Like it was. Uh, yeah, and we would actually like toss shrimp in next to it and with, with it went out and like the snook would not come near the thing. And and we did use it we did catch a snook next to it but we caught a snook right without it either so it was yeah. for a hundred something bucks and i apologize if you guys still are in business um but i think last time i looked it, it had exchanged hands or something had happened um I, I i think that was one that 
as fishermen, most of us were kind of hoping and praying it was going to work just like we were like, this is going to be so cool. And it didn't. And you have to like, the only way it really could work is if you get it out far enough. And if that, if that means you're casting it, which was like basically casting out a bowling ball so heavy and it made this massive splash or you have to slowly let it go with uh, with the current, which means you have to be anchored. It was just, it was just really tough to use. And, and you have to like, you know, you have to tie it on to your boat or something or it's just going to go off forever and you lose it. And so you have line attached to it too, that it comes with. And like the one time we had a fish on, it got wrapped in the line. It was just, it was a massive mess. But yeah, I we, say, we caught fish around it. We got, well, we threw it in a good, in a spot we knew fish were there. Right. And, we and then we pulled it in and, and caught fish was my point earlier. But anyhow, I tell you all that to say, we do unbiased stuff. So let us know what do you want to want us to review. And as Mark said, a big reason we brought him on was to get access to a whole lot more products and all of our insider members get 20% off pretty much everything. And if you can find it in any major tackle store, uh, you're going to be able to get 20% off as an insider member. So if you're not a member, what the heck are you waiting on? We are waiting for you in there with some virtual high fives. Go to saltstrong.com to learn more. Guys, this has been fun. Let's do it again next Tuesday. What do you think? Tackle Tuesday. Oh, snap, crackle pop. Thank you guys for all the support. We be out. Peace.